I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sammy Sino, Amanda Silva, and Raj Shah Martinez. Enjoy. Welcome to the June PRS Journal Club podcast, our six-month anniversary edition, and we're going to get to it right away today because we have a very special guest moderator. I'm Sammy Sino, and joined, as always, by my good friends and co-resident ambassadors, Amanda Silva and Raj San Martinez. Dr. Rourke is in the house. Dr. Rourke, welcome to our podcast. It's great to be here, Sammy. Well, as, as you all know, Dr. Rourke has been a leader in every capacity in plastic surgery, and he is our fearless leader and founder in chief of the premier journal in our field, Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. We have three great articles for you this month. The first is a comparison of the full and short scar facelift incision technique forced in four sets of identical twins and one set of identical triplets by Dr. Derek Antel and company. What they did is very brave. They had four sets of identical twins and one set of triplets where they tried uh, randomized different facelift incision techniques to try to determine which was best in terms of short-term and long-term outcomes. What they actually did for the randomization was do the full facelift incision, including the retroauricular extension in the firstborn twin, with the second-born twin getting the short scar facelift, and then one set of triplets actually did a max lift. They had eight board-certified plastic surgeons rate the results at one in five years. And interestingly, when they looked at short- and long-term differences, both at the nasolabial fold and along the jawline, they didn't see much of a difference between the two techniques. But when they looked at the neck, in the long term, they saw a significant improvement using the long incision. And interestingly, uh, when they actually compared the difference between the short and long-term results in the short scar facelift, they saw a much bigger drop-off. So my overall impression of this article is that it was a very brave attempt to compare the techniques, and it really validates Dr. Dan Baker, who really popularized the short car, uh, scar facelift's uh, current view in that this short scar technique is really a technique with limitations that's best used in a select group of patients that are perhaps younger and have more minimal neck aging. What do you think, Dr. Rourke? I agree entirely. I must. I would applaud these uh, authors for really doing, a, you know, it's so hard to get prospective longer-term results, especially in facial rejuvenation. So I applaud them for doing this and selecting out these patients, especially in twins. I mean, this is a... A really, I think, a landmark study to actually show what plastic surgeons, I think, have intuitively known for a long time, that, you know, when you use a shorter incision, the short-term results look good, but the long-term results are lagging. And, and the key to facial rejuvenation, long-term results, is always how does the neck look? Because you are always judged by the long-term assessment of how well the neck holds up. In a retrospective study of over a 1,000 of my patients, I looked exactly at that too. And the key element in that was that long-term neck rejuvenation held up more if you did supplemental incisions. Um, I did I did an extended incision in all of my patients. but So that's kind of an additive addition into this study was that they looked at the incisions, they, they did the same type of procedure, but they took out more skin. So I would say um, that it's intuitive that this is the, the right thing to do in patients with facial aging. The short incision face that, like Dan Baker said, is good for patients that have minimal to no job and have good necks. So if they have mid-facial aging and no, no neck problem, a short scar facelift is fine. And in many cases, it's sometimes even a marketing tool, as, as Dr. Baker has often said. But I would tell you that the traditional longer scar facelift incision has stood the test of time since the 1920s and um, and obviously has been shown to do so by uh, Dr. Uh, you know, Derek Antel and his, and his co-authors. Kudos to them. And uh, I think it's very interesting in looking at all the images and the ones in the supplemental digital content that 
Interestingly, the twins age very differently, and I know that he's shown this in his previous twin studies. I thought that was uh, unique. He shows very good results despite the aging differences between the twins within the subset. But um, I, I didn't uh, catch in the article him talking about his uh, ideal procedure for treating the neck. I don't know if he opens up the neck um, or not, but I know that you do uh, almost exclusively now in terms of treating the aging neck. Is that right? Well, right, and I think that's, I think, if, you know, every every study has its limitations, and obviously I think the key is to really look at the neck. If they have any platysmal banding that's narrow, uh, you should open the neck. If you have any, you know, a lot of platysmal link or, link or looseness, you should not only open the neck, but you should do a lot of platysmal window. And when you do that, you decrease your chances of having a recurrence, again, both significant stuff, and... Um, and I think that's important. So I think this article, along with, you know, the added data from previous, you know, articles published in PRS, including our own, would substantiate doing the traditional incision, but also, when in doubt, open the neck. If it's full, if, if, uh, if it's a recurrent banding, you need to open the neck and address it. So I think this is a truly great addition to PRS literature. You know, I think this is a keeper. <laughs> uh, one of the one of the other things I was just thinking too, you know, I think Sammy hit the nail on the head. I was really sort of surprised by the twins how different they really looked before anything had happened, and I think that's sort of a potential confounder. But you know, for patients like Dr. Rourke is, is describing that may not have a lot of neck jowling or may not need a lot, this you know, just a short scar may. Do you think Dr. Rourke may would that be good enough for the right patient, even if the long term necks aren't as good as the full? Uh, scars, um, you know, so so that the surgeon can still have some well, leeway in think, choosing a short scar at some point? Well, I think, you know, the short scar incision I use in, in the younger patients. You know, sometimes in the, mm-hmm. you know, in the aging model, the 35 to 40-year-old model that just has some, you know, mid-face sagging. But in, in mm-hmm. those today, I would do fat augmentation centrally right. and then lifting laterally. And I think that's the other part that is really missing, you know, the incision is just one way to look at it. It's the approach, but really what you right. do when you make the incision is more important. And today, the epiphany, the turning point in facial rejuvenation today is filling and lifting mm-hmm. laterally. And I can tell you, that has been the marker that's made the biggest difference in facial rejuvenation in the last decade, just that. So the key has been restoration of fat in the central face via the fat compartment. Mm-hmm. That's been the right. game changer. Right. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a great discussion, Dr. Roy. Thank you, as always, for sharing your knowledge with us. And this definitely is a, a very interesting article. Uh, thank you all for uh, looking at this article with me, and um, we'll see you next time.